The topic for today's platform is making the best of the quarantine, turning lemons into lemonade, and it will be facilitated by three members of the Ethical Education Committee, uh, Samantha Stankevich, who's the Sunday School Director, Beth Stein, who's the Chair of the Ethical Education Committee, uh, and also Mark Stankevich, who is one of the staff members of the, of the Sunday School, and who you know is married to Samantha. Most of you know that. All are art teachers in New Jersey or New York schools. And now I will hand it over to Samantha. Samantha, if you'd unmute yourself and take it away. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first, uh, I saw in the chat that some people said that Mark had wanted to say something. So I'll open it up. Go for it. <laughs> well, I just wanted to um, say that my daughters and I and others, Viola, um, actually participated in a summer camp. Uh, we were there for six weeks, 400 kids, almost 200 staff. We totally did everything differently. We had masks on all the time and not a single incident. And I just, I wanna call that a, a good, uh, good thing. So I wanted to bring that up. Totally fun. We zip lined down 200 feet while other people Unfortunately, we're sitting at home. Yes, and dear, no. did a fantastic job. Um, uh, and it, it, it's a real success story for being outside and be, being careful. Um, so uh, it looks like Beth and I have been planning this and Mark, uh, but we, we have a slight alteration, which I don't see very many kids, which is because it's, um, a Sunday and it's beautiful and it's August. So um, with that, I'm gonna tell you the original, the original plan. It was to have three options. Uh, Mark is running Making Lemonade with children. Um, he has two screens set up right now in the studio so that they can see the actual lemonade making and be making it. So anybody who would like to join Mark for Making Lemonade is gonna go into that breakout room. Um, Beth and I are leading two different discussions. The idea is that Beth uh, Stein's discussion is sort of a more global, um, how is the pandemic affecting education and your opinions on it, the role of government, et cetera. Um, that's a sort of larger picture. My conversation is more about nuts and bolts uh, for parents or anybody interested in how are we going to do this because starting tomorrow for some of us, uh, it's going to be a tidal wave of new information and new systems, just like it was in March, because while March was an emergency, now we have more information, but we haven't really changed that much, and we've changed other things, so we need to kind of see what worked, what didn't, what are plans going forward. So anybody who wants to be in the nuts and bolts conversation is going to join me. Anybody who wants a more global conversation about the you know, pandemic and the education is gonna join Beth. And if you're just in the mood to check out Lemonade, um, you're gonna join Mark and we'll go from there. Um, so- uh, How do you choose on your screen? Uh, that's a good question. Rob is the- Yes. So <laughs> the, the, I'm, what I'm gonna try to do here is I have to assign people to different rooms um, and uh, basically, I think <clears throat> what we talked about doing was we'll try two breakout rooms and then I'm hoping that everybody else just stays in this room, the main room. Um, so what I need to do is just pull out who, which rooms, who's going to go in the kids' room. And let's do that first. And then uh, whoever's going to go into Sam's room, I'll ask that you raise your hand and then maybe I can just assign you from there. It's a little uh, wonky. That seems, but that seems like the only way we're going to really be able to do this. Okay. Um, so for the kids lemonade stand, I have Christina Grant. Who else is going in there, Mark? We got to find you, Mark. You got to put Taylor. Mark and you got to put Mark's iPhone. Mark iPhone. There we go. Anyone else for that room? Emerson. Emerson. Janet Sorry. Glass. Janet Glass. Where em Emerson is listed as who? Maybe Emily. Emily. There we go. Emily Gross. Yes. Can you have, if you have them raise their hands then you that should pop up to your screen a little higher and then you could be able to that's pick them true. off quickly 
Okay, well, I think we have, we have, uh, yes, if anybody else uh, wants to join the Kids Lemonade Party, raise your hand. Um, okay, that's that's all I have for right now for the Kids did you, Lemonade did Party. Did you get Just, Janet Glass? I got Janet Glass in there. Okay. And now for Sam's room, if you want to be in Sam's room, raise your hand. So we have Susan Lesh, anybody else? Diane Kozarski, oops, there we go. Um, yeah, we're taking Ken Carp out of there. I don't know why I have Ken in there twice for some strange reason. Okay, Ken, I think I've got you. Ay, ay, ay. This is <laughs> this is fun. Okay, here, Ken's out. All right, perfect. I have a list here I can look at. Sylvia, sorry, you can all talk amongst yourselves for a moment while I just throw these things on here. Pam. Talk amongst yourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a subject. <laughs> Will we survive this maniac in the White House? Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I have everybody there. If if what I'm going to do is I'm going to break these rooms up, and uh, or start these rooms up, I should say. And if you find that you're not in the room you want to be, chat me and ask me to just throw you into a room and I'll pop you into a room. So here we go. Everybody can lower their hands at the moment. You don't need to have your hands raised. And here I'm gonna open all rooms. And I think we're gonna say, we're gonna try to keep this going more and more out. until about uh, 12 o'clock. Oh, we'll see, hold on, we're, uh, everybody's unmuted here for a second. Okay, here we go. We're gonna start the breakout rooms. You should see a countdown timer. Uh, when it's when it is time element to starting in launch. Hold on just one second, everybody. Uh, uh, we're gonna have a countdown timer of two minutes when the when the parties uh, when, when we're coming back to the main room. Okay, here we go. I'm starting the rooms and go. Let's see if this works. This says not everybody's been assigned to a breakout room. Uh, okay, I think everybody's disappearing yeah. from. Are we all still it's together? Scary, yeah. So I think it's working. Okay, so breakout rooms are in progress. We're still in the main room now. I think this is it, yes? Wow. Yeah. We've it got works. lift off. Ta-da. All right, Beth, over thank to you. you. So good morning. Um, um, thank you for participating. Can excuse you me, yeah, Gail, Gail Farber had, oh, never mind. Forget what I was saying. Go ahead. Sorry. I just want to check that people can hear me. Yes, we can hear. Okay. So this morning, our discussion is going to be ethical issues in education during the pandemic. I did a little research and found um, a couple of news articles that discuss different issues. So as you know, next week, um, millions of students in New Jersey will be returning to some form of schooling whether it be in person, all virtual, or a hybrid approach. Here in New Jersey, the decision on how and when to return is being made on a district by district basis. And there is no one size fits all approach. With parents, teachers, and administrators on both sides of the issue, uh, on both sides of the reopening issue. And what I'm going to do is um, read a couple of these, kind of like when we do ethical dilemmas. And then after I read the scenario, we'll open it up to discussion. So I don't know how long it will take. I put together four different, um, four different issues. Okay. So the first issue I found in the news uh, is from um, August 21st from the New York Times, and it was Teachers as Essential Workers. Last week, Vice President Pence announced that the administration has designated teachers as essential workers, putting them into the same category as medical personnel and law enforcement. While not mandated, this designation is viewed by many as an attempt to uh, bully or otherwise coerce teachers in an effort to open schools and keep them fully staffed. While most of us would agree that teachers are essential to our communities, what this designation really means is that, and this I have in quotes, teachers who have been knowingly exposed to COVID-19 
may continue to work and are not required to quarantine as long as they are asymptomatic. You got that? According to the uh, DHS, teachers are part of our critical infrastructure and we cannot afford to have a teacher shortage due to the quarantine of those who show no symptoms and are able to work. So that's the first issue. Should teachers be designated as essential workers? Um, specifically, do you think that those who have made teaching their profession should be held to the same expectations as those in healthcare or law enforcement? That's the question. So Rob, are you going, Rob, you're gonna unmute people, call on people, or I'm doing it, all right. So how do I see who has their hands up? Over here. Am I being heard? Yes, you are. Okay. Beth, can you can you see the little blue hand on my picture? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So so that's that's what you look for. If somebody raises their hand, there's a little a little a little blue square with a white okay. hand. Yeah. Your hand raised. I got my hand raised. Okay. <laughs> I can talk right. Here. Beth, yeah. Beth, you have to open the participant list. Do I? And yeah, and you can open the participant list as well. I have it open. Okay. All right, so you see there's also a little blue hand next to my name on the uh -huh. participant list. Yeah, okay, cool. So, so the, the essential worker thing, um, I actually think, yeah. yes, teachers should be designated as essential workers, but they should be given the same protections as all the essential workers, right? So if you're going to make that designation, then you want to you wanna give them the same kind of protections that they would have if they were working in a hospital. So there has to be plentiful PPE. There has to, the classrooms have to be set up with social distancing in mind outdoor classes where um, possible should be set up, which means tents in playgrounds while the weather's good enough. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's how you do it, right? It's like, it's like, yes, treat them like essential workers, but don't just label them essential workers. Give them everything that essential workers need, right? So, so that's, that would be my take on it. Right now, they're just throwing out that label, giving no guidelines, and it's up to the individual school districts how they bring their teachers back and in what kind of danger they put their teachers and their students into right so, so, so you feel so, okay i'm sorry go ahead yeah no I, I feel teachers are essential i mean i think they're one of the most essential workers in in the country right we definitely cannot neglect our children's education but it's got to be done in a way that's completely safe so make yeah by all means make them essential but also have the you know there needs to be some central guidance so that all school just districts can follow the same guidelines and not throw children and teachers and administrators into harm's way. Or under the bus, right? Or under the bus, right. 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 Thank you. I see Perry has his hand raised. No, not Perry. I'm sorry. Gail Farber? Yeah. Um, I was just going to comment that the backlash, I mean, I think, Anne, you were absolutely right on. The backlash of not doing it properly is what some of the school systems are dealing with right now, as in my town, where they had 81 people resign um, and therefore close the schools because they couldn't provide safe environment. So people had to take care of their own lives and made that choice. And when the health industry was confronted with this, we know that um, you know, people from all over the country came to fill the, the force and uh, we can't, we can't migrate teachers out of their own community because everybody needs their teachers, but we have to reinvent the wheel or create a safe environment. Otherwise, um, we are really just throwing them into the fire. Okay. Thank you. Perry, do you have your hand raised? Yes, I do. Um, my, my point on this is that uh, it's not so much that they're essential, because obviously you all know the teachers are very important and that they're essential uh, in our lives, particularly at the point where we have children at home. Uh, this, is, to me, is the devils in the details. Um, by designating them as essential workers and not affording proper protection, they're really in danger, you're really endangering everyone because what they're specifically saying is that if you have, if you're a teacher and you have been exposed and you know that you've been exposed. Um, you are not instructed to self-quarantine at that point, as would anyone else. You're told to continue to work. We also know 
that people are hitting their highest point of being contagious just before they become symptomatic. So here you have a teacher working in the school. So you've got a teacher in there with you know, several hundred children and other teachers and administrators and custodians and so on and so forth and interacting with them. Uh, and it, it just seems to me to be a recipe for potential disaster mm -hmm. to instruct someone who's known to be exposed to continue to show up at work. And I get that they're doing it because they, they obviously have a shortage, but uh, it, it seems that they're endangering everyone by doing that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. All right, going once, going twice. All right, next, next discussion. I mean, one, one question. Excuse me, Beth, I, I just, I, I, since I'm a co-host, they don't let me raise my hand. But I wanted to ask a question of Gail Farber. So Gail, you said, did I hear you say 80 some people have resigned from the school system in your town? And, and, and Tenafly just sent out a letter on Friday that their hybrid plan was being um, abandoned because 81 essential people to the system, not all teachers, but other things, people, whatever that they couldn't do without, uh, would not be there to provide any services, so they couldn't they couldn't run school, and that, that is K through twelve. Makes no. I mean, that's that's just that is fact. amazing. I you know I haven't heard that anywhere happening anywhere else. They, they had a very nice has. hybrid system set up. We figured it was going to fall apart because of no PPEs and everybody you know everybody's going to get sick by October, but now they just pulled the rug out completely. And, and, you know, the, the things that the, the healthcare did was also seemed kind of absurd. They were asking, you know, retired physicians, retired nurses to come back in and help. But those are the vulnerable population. If they have retired, they are of a certain age, you know, so that whole thing was kind of crazy. So bringing in extra help is another complexity. But yeah, that, that's why they closed, not because they didn't have decent air conditioning. I mean, obviously they don't, you know, they, they can't provide for these 81 people. Amazing, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do I see more hands? Oh, I do, I see Elaine. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, Paramus has sent a letter to parents, uh, basically saying the same thing. Too many uh, staff people have indicated that they're not gonna um, work require, requesting leave. And so they are going to go remote. It's not official till the board meeting uh, meets tonight, uh, tomorrow night. But um, so it's a real concern, a huge concern. And I, I think Perry's point is really important that people are most contagious, that's the recent understanding, before they show any symptoms. So while screening is good, you know, the temperature checks and do you feel this and that and the other thing, it's not protective. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just, I just read that maybe the, the best clue before you're symptomatic is if you have a change in your um, taste of, uh, sense of taste or smell. Mm -hmm. So the real thing they should be asking people is not, did you travel to any one of those 31 states, but, you know, can you still smell your food? Can you still taste your food? Anyway, so Paramus also. Okay, thank you. Perry, do you have your hand up again? All right, I just have to undo it. All right, is that everybody? Ruth Olson? Yes. I see your hand up. Yes. Um, I have a feeling that, that most of New Jersey is going to go the way of Tenafly. I'm a member of the Guttenberg School Board, which is a very tiny little district. And uh, three days before our last meeting, the plan for reopening changed three times from blended to uh, part only participating um, for the youngest kids and the special needs kids to completely remote. And the reason is it's just not safe, period, full stop. And I think what you're seeing in places like Paramus and Tenafly are 
school districts that wanted to go forward, wanted to reopen the schools, and the teachers are saying no. Mm -hmm. And I was a union rep in the New York City school systems for many, many years, and teachers aren't fools, and they also know they do have a certain power, and they're exercising it now. Uh, it's, it's not right what's being done. And to, to, they're kind of saying, well, teachers will just have to make the best of it. And it's wrong. And I think teachers are beginning to make their voices heard. And I have a feeling that most of New Jersey, if not all, will be remote by the time schools open. And rightfully so. Okay, thank you. I agree. I know I have been a school sub for the past 10 years, and both of the districts in Bergen County where I sub are planning to open in person, one on Thursday, and the other district is delayed until September 14th. I, of course, will not be subbing. Um, the, the other question I wanted to ask is, do you think that teachers should be held to the same standards as the healthcare workers and law enforcement people? In other words, the, the um, law enforcement and healthcare workers go to work knowing that their job entails uh, a certain risk just by the nature of what they do. And not just during the pandemic, of course, uh, there's always risks of working in the healthcare or law enforcement fields. Do you think that teachers should feel the same way that they, you know, their health is, they're putting their health aside for the greater good? Any, any opinion on that? Beth? Yeah. Um, I see that uh, Len and Allison Goldstein had their hand raised. Yeah, I see and, that. And also, uh, I think that was from the last question. I also was going to point out there's a, uh, an article that I just saw from uh, Northern Valley saying that as of now, there are over 80 school districts that due to capacity control decisions have decided to go all remote and not even try. Right. Okay. Allison, hi. Do you want to say something? Allison Goldstein. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, I have a friend who works in a school system in Arizona, which is probably very different than here. But I've been following her week to week issue of having to return to school. She's in no position to retire, although that would be in her medical best interest. Mm -hmm. She has a very severe underlying condition. So I said to her, when push comes to shove, what are you going to do? And she said, I'm going to request a medical leave. She's, she's going for her doctorate. And one of the stipulations of the doctorate is she has to commit to so many years of working in the school system. So she's in this amazing bind. And I was just wondering, um, in New Jersey, is if you're in that kind of a bind, is medical leave an option or is it's sort of an all or nothing proposition. Either you retire or you stay active. I have no idea. Does anyone know the answer to that? Ron Schwartz. Yeah, or Lisa Schwartz. Yeah, it's Lisa. Yeah, I do know that that is an option because I, I have several friends who have exercised that option. Um, so I have a friend who's a school psychologist in River Edge, and she has told me that several teachers have used that. Um, you know, you have to get a note from your doctor to, to specify what it is, and then you can get in. And I guess, though, it might depend on the districts that you're in. I'm not sure if there's, like, any state um, legislation on that, but, um, but of the people I know, they're in several different districts who have exercised that. So. If I can add something to the second part of the mm -hmm. question, which was, um, I guess, you know, should the teachers responsible school, you know, have the same responsibility as, as uh, people in, in hospitals? Well, absolutely not. Um, you know, teachers didn't sign up for this. They signed up to, um, to teach your children to, to make sure that they have better lives. It's ridiculous. Every time something happens in a school, we say, well, the teacher should do this and the teacher should do that. They should have guns because we had shootings. No, they shouldn't have guns because we had shootings. 
And you know, the the the, the biggest um, worry that a teacher should have physically is getting hit by a spitball. But that's about it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, it's ridiculous that we're gonna. You know, teachers already spend their own money on on things for their classrooms because they're under a lot of schools are underfunded as it is. And so, you know, I mean, they didn't sign up to be, um, you know, exposed to disease and to um, take this home to their, their families and, and to um, infect their families either. So no, they shouldn't be considered, uh, you know, the same as a, a, a hospital worker. Okay, thanks for that answer. That was you know, Susan, that I had. Susan's district, which is a county district, Bergen County Special Services. So they have a, a rule where if you or a family member are at risk because of some, a comorbidity, or because of age, you can be excused from in-person teaching and instead just do remote. So it's you or a family a family member. Is that district by district? Or that's for the state? Say that again. Is that option? No, that's Bergen County Special Services School I District. See. It's a it's a county school district. They run the academies and some special uh, needs schools. They've actually since gone completely remote, I think, David. I'm going to take one more and then go on to the next issue. Carol Yeah, Evans? hi. Hi. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I, came, I came in a little late when, when uh, you were talking about Tenafly. So my first question is, um, what did they decide about the Tenafly schools? Tenafly is going completely remote. They are. Did that, they right. make that decision right. today? Because I just spoke to someone yesterday right. who didn't Friday. have that answer. Friday. Friday. Okay, they are. Uh, that's my first yes. question. And also, um, I am considering doing childcare in the, in, in the interim instead of substitute teaching. And one of the families I met, uh, the, the act of the private schools, the, um, the uh, Jewish schools in Teaneck and in Paramus are all having full day schools. And I am a little concerned with, um, I, I was actually talking to a family in Tenafly and they weren't sure what their child was doing, but this family in Teaneck is having their children go to full-time uh, school. And I'm wondering, do, uh, I'm a little concerned that that might put me at risk from their exposure. Cause even though I think that um, anybody who does opt to go to school, it's probably not gonna last more than three or four weeks before there's some sort of um, second wave. But I'm, uh, does anybody have any feelings though, uh, as to whether or not that might be um, too much jeopardy to, to be exposed to kids who are going to school. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not much different than being in the school, I guess. The kids are exposed in the school. But I guess it's the That's what I was concerned about. I, I, don't, yeah, I don't think you can evaluate it, like, it. That's the problem, right? You, there's too many unknowns. I know. It definitely I just don't puts know if you I'm, at greater risk. I know. But, right. It does, Everyone right? Everyone has to make it a does. personal I decision so. about what, you know, what risk they're willing to tolerate. And, and well, they, they're socially distancing and the children are wearing masks all day from oh. eight to three, which I think is insane. Uh, it's hard to breathe for that length of time in a mask. So they're wearing masks and they're socially distancing, but kids still wipe their noses and touch each other. And, you know, it's just uh, a little scary. That, that it's sort of a fantasy to think that Children are going to actually wear a mask all day. That, I know. I don't, if they're, if they're I don't, I don't trust that either. Hope people don't have and knows that that's just a non-starter. So it sounds like that's not a wonderful option for me. But the tenafly was interesting well, news to be, I th to be uh, honest. for me. So uh, are there any schools, any public schools that are going back in a hybrid situation? At yeah, I think a lot of the um, districts in the northern part of the county. Yeah. Where I saw um, Old Japan and uh, Harrington they're Park doing are planning that, huh? to go back. Oh, Harrington Park is a late opening. Maybe they're outfitting the building. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, they need the filtration. They right. have to, you know, all of that. I, I don't I'm know what everybody's doing. I'm in Tenafly right now. I'm in Tenafly right You're now. Yep, yeah, I'm in Tenafly. I'm sitting here in the field next to the middle school. And for graduation, they did social distancing out in the field, and everybody was there with their cap and gown, uh, but six feet apart from each other. They might have classes outside at first. No, I guess it's good for a short 
I'd like to move on to the next topic. Thank you for all your contributions. And Beth, I'll try to Beth, call on different people this time. Yeah. Uh, Beth, I think Eileen White has her hand up. Okay. I just wanted to say my daughter-in-law works in Lodi, which is also Bergen County. And as far as I know, it was it's opening also. Hybrid kind of thing with teachers expected to teaching the kids online and in the classroom. Very difficult. The same teacher, mm -hmm. Lodi, which is southern, more southern Bergen County. Okay, thank you. So this is something I found last week in the New York Times on August 22nd, which was really disturbing. And the title of the article was COVID in the classroom, or some, school, some schools are keeping it quiet. According to a New York Times article dated August 22nd, some schools and school districts are providing detailed data on school outbreaks of COVID-19, while others are choosing to keep such information under wraps. In Camden County, Georgia School District, administrators were instructed to keep teachers quiet regarding staff member who, a staff member who tested positive for the virus. Staff members who test positive are not to notify any other staff members, parents, or their students, or any other person or entity that they have may have been exposed, said John Miller, district deputy superintendent, in a confidential email. Parents in the district heard by word of mouth of more confirmed cases, and some were called by local officials telling them their child should be quarantined, but the district has refused to publicly confirm a single case with their standard answer to the community being, we can neither confirm nor deny, citing privacy concerns to withhold information to the dismay of anxious parents and educators. Um, in many places, reopening schools has taken on a partisan bent. And when the schools have to shut down, because when schools have to shut down, it doesn't look good politically to governors and lawmakers who have advocated to opening up so the potential is there to hide behind privacy laws. State notification policies vary widely across the country with some places reporting positive cases in schools and others not required to report COVID-19 cases to health departments. Ones that do say privacy concerns prevent officials from sharing details with the public. Yet privacy laws such as HIPAA do not bar public schools from releasing information about cases as long as they do not provide personal details about those who are infected. The federal education and health departments have said, and in some situations that may even be allowed. Schools have, I'm almost done. Schools have often abused privacy laws to hide info that could expose them to lawsuits or negative media coverage in the name of protecting personal privacy. Many districts may be, and in the name of protecting personal privacy, many districts may be sacrificing public health concerns. Sorry that that was a little lengthy. So I found this kind of shocking and disturbing. So question, if a teacher finds, um, discover, if a teacher discovers that a student or coworker has tested positive, do you feel he or she has an obligation to notify parents even if a school has forbidden this? Right. Any hands on that? I, I, so. Absolutely. I have my hand up. Okay. Oh, I see also Ruth Olson. And okay, Lisa. First. Yeah, I I would say absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I don't have anything else to say. I think it would be an obligation of anybody who is in the proximity of somebody who you know has COVID to not inform others about it. I mean, it's just the even right- Even if the school, even if your administrators have forbid it? You know, yeah. <laughs> well, those of us who are teachers and, and have been in situations, I was a school social worker and I had, you know, ethical dilemmas, and, you know, came up with, you know, if I put my job at risk, that's a, I mean, that is a tough question. It is a tough question. You're not close to retirement. You need your job, your livelihood, and you feel, and you're, you're maybe not tenured. Um, 
that's it, you know it's it's a very personal decision um, on how much somebody really wants to risk their career, their livelihood, to take take that stand. I personally, maybe you know, I'm privileged and, and I could be in a position to say I would do that. Um, but that's you know that's that's a that's a tough it's one. Certainly an ethical um, dilemma. But I would say the right thing to do is absolutely because you're talking about lives here, um, and you know, and then if the district was to take retaliatory measures, you'd have to take it up with the union and really fight it. But I think the right thing to do would be absolutely do the right, do the thing, right thing because so i guess the die. larger question here is do you think the need for public safety outweighs an individual's right to privacy that's an, yes. another, yes. another question too. Yes. Uh, i see um laszlo has a hand up or edna hmm. yes hi yeah i think that if if someone finds themselves positive then if you don't tell people around you, then how can you be traced, you know, do the contact tracing and try to narrow it down rather than spreading it? Uh -huh. It's, it's um, I think it's that obligation for the larger community that's important. Uh, I have to say, in practice, it may ever can't, that it's going to be the, COVID, the virus is going to spread and many people are going to get sick uh then it, it's going to basically overwhelm the hospitals and it's going to be obvious you know what's going on uh the, the other side of it is if they're successful they say they're gonna say that oh you told you so so that's unfortunately this is this is this is one of those things when it would be ethically i think it's the correct thing to do is to act on the caution on the caution side but in practice it may work out that uh, you know they may I know they may they survive it uh, reasonably depending you know they, they make they're taking the chance of course possible i think the probability is that it's not going to happen i mean it's going to happen there's going to be uh, an outbreak and it's going to uh, become obvious if, if many many of the schools do that uh, they, they it's inevitable that's that's what you know the scientists tell you that mm -hmm. if, if, the, if there's no control it's going to be uncontrolled and if it's uncontrolled it's going to be destructive so that's it I think it's terrible that the teachers are being put into such political positions. Yeah. It's terrible. Uh, I see Barbara. Barbara Lamberg. Um, I worry that there's going to be more and more political pressure, especially from Trump who want, and Republican areas who wants to keep the numbers down and have it look good. Right. And act like it's all over. And I think there's also going to be a lot of pressure from administrators at private schools um, who are afraid their schools are going to shut down and they're going to lose money. So I think it's a real danger. Of course, ethically, it should be reported, but I know there's going to be a lot of pressure. How can have them? I wonder how parents can be safe if they can't trust the school to be telling them the truth. How right. can parents feel safe sending their kids to school? Uh, Elaine. Yeah, you know, I, I'm thinking back to elementary school days with the kids, and they would come home with a note saying that someone in the class had lice. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so the first thing you do is scratch your head, of course. But so anyway, the, the, the point is that the, the schools have a history of informing parents if there's something that could be of concern and i i if they've been doing that legally for years they certainly could do this and you don't mention names um so you know i i do think if you if you truly want to keep people safe you need to spread this information um you know a lot of the governors and our president are really focused on making things look good but not either purposely or maybe unable to grasp the science uh, behind it. So, um, but I do recognize, you know, what um, Lisa was saying, it's really tough if it's your livelihood, you're concerned for your job. And, um, you know, what one would hope in these situations is more senior teachers who have 
um, good standing in their communities and have tenure can be a little more forceful. They're in a better position perhaps to do that. It's almost like they're being asked to aid in the bet, and you know they are being aid, aid to aid in the bet and the cover up of, of a crime. So, um, at least that's how I see it. Ruth Olson. Yes, um, I I taught my whole teaching career in New York, and in New York, teachers are mandated reporters. Uh, we can be punished and fired if we we don't report health and safety and um, point. You know, psychiatric issues. I don't know if that's the case in New Jersey. It's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah, but I, right, and I think you'll find this kind of bullying of teachers more in states, and I don't want to be too partisan here, that are highly Republican, highly conservative, uh, what I think it was Anne who said, private schools, that, well, private schools have a different thing because if too many kids get um, get sick, the parents are going to know. And then the school may be, uh, people may pull their, their kids from the school. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But certainly in public schools in very conservative uh, areas that agree with the present administration, will probably try to shut them down. And that's why you need unions. Uh, my parents were union organizers, and I'm a firm believer, as, as bad as some of them have become, I'm a firm believer that you need unions in order to do these things correctly and to protect yourself. Thank you. Okay. We see some more hands up. Should we continue this or move on to the next issue? What do you guys think? So, um, yeah. have not spoken yet? All right, I want to do a, yes. Sean has his hand up. Okay. And I have my hand up. Carol. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Um, I was told that in the private schools, if two people get, in, in, the, in the Jewish schools anyway, um, if two ca two cases uh, become apparent, they have to close down the whole school. But they're waiting for two cases. That's just unfathomable. Um, so I uh, that's just another point I wanted to make. Okay, thank you, Ron and Lisa. Yeah, as an attorney, I would think that the uh, school districts in those places that are prohibiting reporting of this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're going to have to think about liability issues if um, their failure to report leads to kids and adults becoming ill and then facing lawsuits that they did not report uh, this information that could have, uh, you know, stop people from getting sick or saving lives. So. Uh, I I think the article implied that they do have to report it to the health officials. They're just prohibiting teachers from gossiping about it, basically. Well, they're calling gossiping. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would I would think that would be a still would be a liability issues if um, the teachers are right. mandated not to make it public. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think they're hiding behind HIPAA laws, basically. They are. But the truth is, you don't have to give the person's name to say that there's been two cases, right? You don't have to give name or age or address or anything personal. So That's right. It's kind of a lame argument, I think. Uh, who else didn't? Anyone else have their hands up? Laszlo? Did you have something to add? No? Okay, I'm going to move on to the next issue. Okay. People should put their hands down, should click on lower hand once they've spoken, yeah. if they don't have anything else to say. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the last one I'm going to discuss, because I think we have about five minutes, is um, affect you might have read about this. This is from earlier in the epidemic from April. 
how teachers grades um, how teachers grade students has changed in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Should how schools grade <coughs> students change too? So the article states that many colleges are considering this question. Some are offering pass fail or credit no credit as the default grading system instead of letter grades. Some students are pushing for a universal pass, a semester during which no one can fail. Should high schools and middle schools also consider changing their grading policies? And the argument is um, that there are inequalities in education created by the pandemic. Not everyone has access to the same um, resources. So to make it fair, a lot of the colleges were saying that this year we won't point averages, we'll just have pass fail. And then there were students who were saying that um, um, the article cited the case of a student who had to leave college because of the pandemic. And when he went home, he could no longer study because he found that he was the caretaker for his younger sister. And he had to spend his day online helping her with school. And he had to help out with chores. So there, not everyone is in the same situation. So he felt it should be pass fail the one student they interviewed. But other students say they've, you know, they've worked really hard and they need that grade point average to get into good schools and they don't want pass fail grades. They want real grades. So what do you think about that? What's mm. the fair thing to do? There's, there are inequities. Uh, Anne. Yeah, so, so I, I think that the, um, you know, what we have to look at, we have to look at students who are vulnerable anyway. So whether it be higher education or um, uh, grade school, the students with um, lack of resources at home, so usually lower income students that do not have access to the internet or even a computer that they can use each, um, are really, are really going to suffer with um, uh, virtual studying. Um, students with any kind of learning disability that can no longer get the in-class aids that they are used to having will suffer. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who's um, actually, and this goes further than that, anybody whose teacher or professor is less than organized, and I've seen this firsthand from my two trying to study from home. Some of these professors at, at a, a well-known college were extremely poor at organizing the work virtually, not getting assignments out in time to the students to complete, not posting lectures on time, not giving the students the information they needed to be able mm -hmm. to complete the assignments successfully. So again, this is all going to impact their grades um, because it's, you know, it's, it's just, it, I think in order to make it fair, the, the pass-fail might be the way to go. I mean, I'd be for that. Um, it's not going to negatively impact anybody's grades because, you know, once they're back to in-person classes, I'm assuming the, they'll get grades again and the, the pass-fail doesn't affect you one way or another, right? It's, it's a neutral. Okay. Uh, thank you. Perry? Just tagging on to that, I think that as within a college environment, it may not be as important within it, it you know, helping establish your... Uh, where you stand within your class, but uh, for kids who are in high school, uh, who uh, their financial aid to get into college, they're getting into college in the first place, is directly affected by their GPA. There has to be some standardization with the college application process mm -hmm. to allow for this, because the reality is, is that there are a lot of children who do can on that and there are obvious inequalities that once you move uh, school to being a remote situation, you're now having, you know, your ability somewhat based by zip code in terms of your, your ability to succeed in that environment. So um, I would say that pass fail is fine, but there has to be uh, universal arrangements made uh, with uh, college applications that is taken into account and not uh, held against the student who's, uh, you know, trying to apply, particularly those trying to apply for financial aid. Right. So if you're an A student and it's pass fail, I'm, I don't know what grade that's, how that's averaged into your grade. So affect your grade point average, I guess. Mm -hmm. Who else is a hand up? Laszlo? 
Is that current or that's not? I, I mean, I have to preface it because my daughter worked basically on how to equalize college admissions. Uh, so ah. she, she did a lots of lots of stuff on that and uh, talked to admissions things. I mean, essentially, this is the, comes down to a fundamental issue: what do grades measure? What do grades measure? You know, do, do, do they um, do they measure performance? Uh, uh, your class, your you know. So it's 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 going to you know decisions that we that we make. I mean, it could be major uh, for the moment, but it's it's a long term issue that I think has to be faced, and it's a, it's a probably a good time be having such a man to discuss this entire issue of grades admissions. Uh, you know, in a part in education. So you saying it brings out a larger mm -hmm. issue about grading and the role of education and the importance of grades. Yes. So a uh, about the measure. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Perry, is your hand up again? We just didn't take it down. No. Okay, that's it. Tracy. I was just going to say that you know, we're talking about it from the perspective of what students want. Um, but I also think schools will have to make accommodations. They're, they can't use the same pre pandemic. There are you're going to have to figure out a way to balance the fact that education was on a semi hiatus uh, and that you can't go by grades in the same way as and the other thing i wanted to say was it's interesting to me that there hasn't been a, an emphasis and a positive emphasis on what teachers are doing to learn how to effectively there's no emphasis on that so you only hear the the negative and and i think that teachers are working really hard and creatively to make a good learning experience remote, and that's not being lifted up enough um, to educate the, the parents as to okay yeah. Yeah. I'm breaking the sound is breaking a little uh, quickly one point could people who are not speaking mute themselves it's breaking up the sound badly if if you're not speaking yeah you know what I'll mute everyone and then people can unmute themselves. I should have done that. So David, I, they, I pressed the button a little late, but people should be wrapping up in, in less than 60 seconds, all the rooms okay. are closed. We got your, we did get your message, Rob. Oh, I good. I passed through. Although I discovered we had no way to reach you. <laughs> Right. So, I, oh. so I think we oh. can conclude that the pandemic raises a lot of ethical issues and probably there will be more that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, thank you for participating. <laughs>